the market for funds determining the rate of interest in an economy. We know that in any economy, the total amount of investment, actual investment, has to be equal to the total amount of savings. But that is not to say that desired investment has to be equal to desired savings. So how do those two come into balance? Well, allocating scarce resources is the role of markets. So we need a market for investable funds. The financial sector performs the role of intermediating between all the savings and all the needs of investors. It does so through its institutions, commercial banks, near banks and insurance companies, and through financial markets, the stock market and the bond market. These different channels all have their different ways of operating and different terminology. So if a saver is going to put his savings into the financial sector through a commercial bank or a near bank, it's called making a deposit. If they do so through an insurance company, it's called paying a premium. If it's a stock market, it's a stock purchase. Bond market, it's a bond purchase. On the investor side, on the borrowing side, it also has its different names. You borrow from commercial banks or near banks, insurance companies invest. Uh, uh, stock market is, stock is issued by a company that wants to finance its investment or it can sell a bond. What we want to do is to abstract from all of these different channels, the differences amongst these different channels and treat the entire financial sector as one giant market for investable funds. So we're going to ignore the details of the differences amongst these different channels and treat the entire financial sector as one giant market for investable funds. So all of those different ways of characterizing what savers do with their savings, we simply call the supply of funds. And all of the different ways that investors will access those funds, we call the demand for funds. So we're aggregating the entire financial sector. If we're going to model the market for funds, then to model any market, we need three elements. We need a price. What is the price of borrowing and lending? We need to know the source of the supply of funds. And we need the source of the demand for funds. So we need, a, we need to know what the price is. We need to understand the supply side and we need to understand the demand side. Since we are aggregating the entire financial sector into one aggregate market, then we speak of the rate of interest. In reality, of course, we know that there are many rates of interest in an economy. Those differences, that variation in different interest rates, is due to differences in other than the time value of money. Added to the time value of money is whether you're lending to a government, which tends to be safer than lending to a commercial operation, or whether you're lending, it can be due to whether you're lending for a short term, like three months, or a long term, like 15 years. It can be due to whether the debt is collateralized or uncollateralized. So there are many of these factors that determine, in the case of a particular loan, what the rate of interest is in relation to the average rate of interest across, across the economy. Nonetheless, 
we want to understand the market as a whole and what determines the average rate of interest. And for all of the factors that affect the average rate of interest, then as far as those factors are concerned, it's going to affect all rates of interest more or less equally most of the time. So we're going to get away with speaking of the rate of interest in the economy. It is the real rate of interest that guides lending and borrowing decisions. And so that is the price in the market for credit, in the market for investable funds. So on the vertical axis, we have the real rate of interest. On the horizontal axis, we have the quantity of funds being loaned to the financial sector or being borrowed from the financial sector. So let's see if we can get an idea of what is the shape of supply curve, supply of funds. We pick an arbitrary starting point, the current rate of interest, and, and let's say, suppose the rate of interest is 7%, and if it is 7%, then $10 million is made available to the financial sector for it to lend out. There are three possible sources of savings in an economy. Private domestic savings, foreign savings, savings by foreigners that they send into the local economy and make it available, and government savings. Government taxes more than it spends. If interest rates go up, then two things might happen. That higher rate of interest might incentivize domestic households and businesses to save more. Probably not by much because there are other factors at work. You know, a higher rate of interest may incentivize you to save more, but at the same time, if you're pursuing a savings target, a higher rate of interest means you can actually achieve it by saving less. So we're not going to make too much hay out of a higher rate of interest, stimulating more domestic savings even though that is likely to happen to a small extent. But there's another channel that a higher rate of interest will make local interest rates, other things remaining unchanged, higher relative to other economies where mobile international capital can earn a return. So other things remaining unchanged, a higher rate of interest in this economy is going to cause an inflow of foreign savings to take advantage of the higher rate of return. So through either of these channels, higher rate of interest will result in a greater quantity of funds available in the market for credit. The supply of funds curve is upward sloping. Let us now convince ourselves that the demand for funds curve is downward sloping. The demand for investable funds. Again, we pick an arbitrary starting point. At any time, there is a variety of potential investment projects that can be funded. And there's going to be a variety of rates of return on those projects. A few of those are illustrated. If the rate of interest is low, then it is more likely that a large number of projects will yield a return higher than that low rate of interest. And so there will be great demand for investable funds. There'll be great demand for loans to finance these investment projects. If the rate of interest were higher, then that is going to make some of the investment projects that were viable at a lower rate of interest now unviable. And fewer investment projects are going to yield a return higher than this new higher rate of interest. So the demand for investable funds will be less. The demand for investable funds curve 
is downward sloping. Now that we have our demand and our supply, then this works like every other market with which we are familiar. If the real rate of interest is too low, the demand for funds is greater than the supply of funds. Banks and other lenders are going to realize that a lot of investment demand and demand for borrowing is unsatisfied and they can actually make more money by raising their, their interest rates. So interest rates will tend to rise. If the current real rate of interest is too high, then we have surplus savings laying idle in the financial sector, not being borrowed by investors, earning zero. And therefore, lenders, commercial banks and other lenders, are going to realize that they can actually earn more profit by lowering their rates of interest to entice more borrowers to come in and take advantage of their idle funds. In this way, the real rate of interest will tend towards the one that clears the market for investable funds, that equates the demand for funds with the supply of funds. And in this way, the market for credit determines the real rate of interest. And once we have the real rate of interest, then since we know the relationship between the real and nominal rates, then by adding the inflation rate to the real rate of interest, we know what is going to be the nominal rate of interest in an economy. So we've determined the real rate of interest and the nominal rate of interest. Let's do an exercise with our model. What is the effect on the rate of interest and the amount of investment of the government enacting an investment incentive. Let us say they give a tax credit on new investment. So they forego taxes they would otherwise uh, be in receipt of if businesses make new investment. Well, this is going to increase the return that is due to the investment to companies that would otherwise have had to pay more taxes than in the absence of the investment incentive. So that is going to incentivize them to actually make more investments. Interest rates are going to go up as they seek to borrow the funds and the quantity of investment increases. So far, so good. Let's look at another not unrelated exercise. What is the effect on interest rates and investment of the government running a fiscal deficit? Let us say currently its budget is balanced. So the supply of credit is made up of that which comes from domestic savers, domestic private savers, and foreign savers. The government savings term is zero because the budget is balanced. If it runs a fiscal deficit, then it means that has to be financed by taking some of what is in the potential pool of savings that was due to domestic private savings and foreign savings. The government takes out of the pool of savings to pay for its excess spending. So there is less saving available for investors to borrow. That shifts the supply of investable funds curve to the left, which means interest rates are higher and the amount of investment falls. This is referred to as government crowding out private investment, by the way. Now, these two exercises we have done are not unrelated. If the government is going to forego tax revenue in order to incentivize private investment, and then it has to pay for the, that fiscal gap 
by going into the market and itself taking savings to finance the loss of tax revenue, then what ultimately happens to the amount of investment is unclear. Let's do another exercise based on some real world experience. What is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on equilibrium interest rates in any economy? This article argues that the lockdown of economies during the COVID-19 crisis creates conditions in which private sector demand for investment will fall while at the same time savings are going to increase precautionary savings because households are going to be concerned about how long the crisis is going to go on and how long they're going to have to provide for themselves maybe in the presence of job losses to come. This article suggests that the crisis will cause equilibrium interest rates to fall. Well, we can illustrate this on our market for investable funds. It says that businesses will be reluctant to invest, so demand for investable funds will fall. Savers might want to increase their savings, at least initially, to provide for an uncertain future. And the result of that will be interest rates falling. And so our takeaway from this is that we want to know what determines interest rates in an economy. Interest rates are determined in the market for investable funds.